Howdy. <laughs> and welcome to the services this morning. What a joy it is to worship with you. A couple of special prayer needs before we get started officially, and we are officially started. Um, Miss Freddie sits with Diane here. She's in Rogers area under hospice care this morning. She has not had a good week. Please remember her when you pray. And we have some former members, <clears throat> Amanda Rowe. I don't, you may not remember her, but she had the loss of her oldest son, Drake, just graduated from Bologna High School, and uh, he, he died tragically, I think, Friday evening. But, and um, David Bluker's niece, I understand, has passed away. So we've got the, is that right, David? So we've got special needs this morning among our church. And it is a joy to see. You. I ran up the stairs, so I've got to get my breath there. Just give me a second. <laughs> I would lead us in prayer, but I don't know if I can right, right now. That's pitiful. But I'm glad that you're here. We welcome back some that have not been here uh, since March. And others, we're glad you're here this morning. Please, um, Help us to maintain social distancing. We have, if you'll let us, we'll help you out the doors when we're finished. Our ushers will help you, and we'll just keep from congesting, being congested. And I know you want to speak to folks, and let's just do the things that we need to do to practice this and be safe during this time. And I think it will also encourage other members that are a little leery about coming back if, if we'll if we'll be careful and, and, and do the things we're supposed to do. Good to see you. Good to have visitors this morning in our sanctuary and uh, in the back. And we thank you for joining us here at North Hills. Father, thank you for the joy that we have to worship you this morning. Thank you for every blessing of life. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of these very unrestful pandemic days. You're still our God. You're on your throne. And we love you and we praise you. And we're going to worship you and I thank you for the honor that, we're, that we have. Together here and some of our people still at home and thank you for their presence as well and their prayers. Bless the needs of our church this morning. Care for those that are grieving and and others that are about to give up loved one, we ask you to bless, please, in every situation in life. Please lead us into worship of our great God this morning, Holy Spirit. I pray when we leave, we will have sensed your presence, and we will leave saying it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. Amen. shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saber looks to gather home we're on the other shore and the road is called up yonder i'll be there when the road is called up yonder 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 i'll be there Bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and the work on earth is done, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder. When the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road, when the road is called. 
called up yonder on the day. When the road is called up yonder on the day. When the road is called up yonder. When the road is called up yonder, I'll be testimony time and and I was realized and was reminded after the service that those are watching at home are unable to hear the testimonies and there was just kind of dead silence there and so this morning I, I think it would be good just to have some prayer requests and then we're going to spend some time just before the throne and, and asking God to bless uh, so any anyone with a special prayer need that I have not already mentioned this morning that on your heart that you'd like our church to be praying with you and for you uh, uh, this morning. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. Remember the special need this morning. Brother Mark, family member. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, sir. Say it again a little bit louder, David. 
Okay. Okay, I understand. All right. Yes, sir? country sure in, in need of divine help. Brother David, would you mind just coming here to the altar this morning? We won't be able to give you a microphone, but uh, we'd like everyone to participate as we bow and pray together. Um, any other special needs that we want to remember? Those that are grieving today. Okay. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Unspoken. Okay. Others? All right. Amen. Brother David, would you lead us to the throne of grace? Oh, this 
truly love us he does does the spirit move among us he does and does Jesus our Messiah oh forever those he loves he does does our God intend to dwell again with us he does Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal that opens the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. For many people in tribe, every nation and tongue. 
has made us a kingdom and priest to God to raise with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He is. He is. Lord, you are worthy. Above all. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace that you show to us every day. Even though we're not worthy, by your blood, we are made worthy. Lord, we just ask right now that you'll bless the words that Brother Jim brings to us. Lord, we just ask that you will touch hearts and our minds. Open them up so that we can receive your word and take it to this lost and dying world. Change lives today, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Got a note here this morning that says that the flowers that are so beautiful this morning, are grown and provided by Ray and Kelly Owens. Owens, They are placed here in the altar as a big thank you to everyone who has continued to donate and support the children's ministry over this past year. So we'll enjoy those this morning. If you will, find in your Bible the book of Judges. We're going to start in a few moments with the first couple of verses from chapter 1, and if you will keep your Bibles open, several verses that we'll be reading throughout the course of the message this morning, will, will, you'll want to read with me and, and talk with me and think with me about some things that <clears throat> happened and went on in the life of the nation of Israel <clears throat> and how true it is this morning that uh, we are uh, just paralleling everything that Israel did, <laughs> and we can reap the same, expect to reap the same consequences uh, as, as they did. I carry a, I think as you, carry a heavy burden in my heart for our nation. Um, in the midst of this virus season, now there's anarchy in the streets and, and the burning down of buildings and the tearing down of statues and the setting up of places where they want no police, the defunding of police departments. New York City has taken a billion dollars out of their budget for their police department this year. It is just unbelievable times, in my opinion. And some of the things I will say to you this morning will, will be maybe opinion, the opinion of your pastor. And if you choose not to walk with that or accept that, that's, that's, I, I get that. But I know what Israel did, and I know what we're doing, and I know what we've done in the past as a nation. And I think I know where we are this morning uh, as, as a nation as well. In uh, last year in 2019, Joe and Barbara made a trip out west. They visited Tombstone and some of the old western cities. And, and along the way, they 
stopped by a place, and I'm not, not sure what city they were in. And in this particular city, they, they uh, came across a couple that's, that's uh, promoting and putting together monthly a uh, publication chronic, chronicling the Old West. And what they've done is take uh, articles from newspapers from, from Tucson, Tombstone, all over everything that happened, and they're compiling it, and, and uh, then the mailing it. Well, Joe, Joe bought a subscription and bought me one, and I have just thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And this week, while I was reading the July issue, I saw something that, that I'd like to share with you this morning, uh, just to start off today's thoughts. And what, what the publishers have done is they've tried to say, you know, we're in this pandemic time, this virus season, but it might not be so bad when you look back at, at time. For example, at the break, at the, the brink of the 1900s, and the 1800s no longer existed, and the 19s were, were coming and were here. So 120 years ago, this is what he shares was, was, the, was the way it was in America. He says the average life expectancy in the United States was, what do you think it was? Pardon me? 40, 47. The average life expectancy. Only 14% of the homes in the United States 14%, 120 years ago, had a bathtub. 8% of the homes had a telephone. You think about all the phones that's in their hands of, of Americans today. There were only 8,000 cars in the United States and only 144 miles of paved roads. The average wage in the United States was 22 cents an hour. The average U.S. worker made between $200 and $400 a year. More than 95% of all births took place, where do you think? At home. 95% of all births took place at home. 90% of all U.S. physicians had no college education. I, I, don't, I think that's probably about the same today. <laughs> Instead, they attended medical schools, many of which were condemned in the press and by the government as substandard. Now, ladies, I, I was holding this one almost for last. You will be blessed to know this. Most women, now it uses the word most, most women only washed their hair how many times a month? <laughs> Once a month. And when they did, they used borax or egg yolks as shampoo. The five leading causes of death, 1900. What do you think is number one on the list? Leading cause of death. Pneumonia. Pneumonia was the leading cause of death. Tuberculosis was second. Diarrhea was third. Heart disease was fourth. And stroke was fifth. We've not come a whole a long ways, have we? That seems to me like. We, we, we have more cars. We got more things, but we're still about the same people. This morning from the book of Judges, we want to we make a comparison, if you will. A comparison of the things that was going on in the land of Israel and a comparison of the things that's going on in the United States. Not necessarily just today, but it does include today, but in, in, in recent days, if you will. So let's look back, first of all. God brought Israel out of Egypt, major milestone for them. 
brought them to Sinai, and there he gave a law, the law that he expected them to live under. He moved them toward the promised land. Before they reached the promised land, they paused and they sent 12 spies out. And because of their unbelief and their lack of faith, they spent 40 years then wandering in the wilderness. At the end of that 40-year period, God calls Moses home, and Israel is without their beloved leader. And so God raises up Joshua now to take the reins that Moses had to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. In a little bit, we'll read from where our first text will be verses 1 and 2 of the first chapter. But we're going to read in the second chapter about, about his death, Joshua's death. So let's think about, before we read that, about the book of, of Judges. Judges spans, the book spans about 350 years. Our nation has, well, we just celebrated the fourth a few days ago. 244 years our nation has, has been a nation, if you will. Israel went through a number of cycles during this 340-year period. And here's what they would do. They would depart from God. They would, and it, this, these things were not just, just as the old saying goes, they, they just didn't jump off the diving board in, into the cesspool. It was a gradual decline and pulling away from God until God brought chastisement from another nearby uh, nation that was strong and powerful. He would raise them up bring oppression against Israel. Israel would plead and beg and ask God for, for help. God would then raise up a judge, and, that, and then that judge would bring deliverance. There were about 14 different judges throughout this 340-year this period that God went through. So that's how many cycles that, that, that there were in the, in the nation. Someone said that those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. Now let's take a look and compare a nation that dealt, had to deal with God because of their, of their unbelief and their wanting to go their own way and make that comparison with ours. So would you mind standing please and we'll read two verses quickly and then we'll move on through here. The first two verses as the book opened says, Now it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So here's the twelve tribes. The Canaanites are there. there they're, going, they're going to be the first. Who's going to go against the Canaanites? So the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Thank you very much, and we're going to just pause there for a moment, but you may be seated because we're going to read some other verses uh, at presently. Judah. Judah means praise. I don't know if you know that or not. The name Judah means praise. I think it seems to me like anyway that God was saying when, when the, the nation moves against the Canaanites, when this tribe moves against the, the Canaanites, I want praise to go before, before them. God gave himself to them, the nation, and they had a Lord. God gave them the Ten Commandments, and they had a law. God gave them Cana, and they had a land. They had a Lord, they had a law, they had the land. And do you know what they did with all three things? They denied the Lord. They defied the law. And they defiled the land. Striking resemblance as we look at what we've done in 244 years as a nation. First of all this morning, my first point is days of compromise. Or days of comparison, rather. Days of comparison. Israel, one victory after another. Armies marching well. Walls fell. Kings were subdued. Lands were taken. They were doing well, and God was blessing. 
He had promised them that if they would go into the promised land, he would give it to them. But it wasn't going to just move in and set up your tents and start living there. You are to drive out the inhabitants of the land that's already there. In America, how did we have our beginning? We had a similar beginning, I think, as did Israel. And I'm going to back up to 1775, a year before we actually had our, had our, uh, our beginning, if you will. Patrick Henry was the spark, seemingly, that, that began the, the work. This is what he said in 1775. Is life so dear or, or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains, chains and slavery? God forbid it, Almighty God. I do not know what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. In the next year, when George Washington took the oath of office, he did so with a Bible in his hand. And do you know what happened after they took the oath? He led members, not all of them, but members of Congress to a local church where they had a two-hour worship service. That was the beginning of the nation. There were, there, there were just days of wonderful things that people were doing, and God was blessing as they settled in the land. Blessings from God all about. But the second thing I note this morning with you is that there were days of gradual compromise. Days of gradual compromise on Israel's part and our nation's part as, as well. One of the three visits you'll find at, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of um, Judges is from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the second verse, second chapter rather, verses 1 and 2. Now the angel of the Lord, that's, that's a reference to the Lord Jesus, came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Did you hear that? You shall make no covenants with the inhabitants of this land. Well, we've, what we've done as a nation, we invite everybody that wants to come to our nation and bring your God with you and, and bring your ways and bring this and bring that. We, we're glad to have you. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars. And then he said to them, but you have not obeyed me. What is this that you have done? He's asking Israel for some answers concerning their, their godless lives. I gave you everything, says the Lord Jesus. I brought you out of Egypt. I gave you victory after victory. I said, don't make any league with the people that live in this land. And then he says, why have you done exactly what I told you not to do? Verse 7, drop down the same chapter 2. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. Now, there is an important thing to note. So all the people that had been with Joshua and the elders that had been with him served the Lord. But watch this. And all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done. As long as they were seeing what God was doing, they were serving. As long as they were seeing God drive out some inhabitants and doing some things, they were serving. But drop down to verse 10 and watch this. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. The generation I'm just talking about, the generation that saw God work and the generation that experienced God's leading and leadership and the things he had done, all that generation were gathered to their fathers. Now watch this. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord nor yet the work which he had done in Israel. Unbelievable. A new generation. Unbelievable, is it not, in America? 
We've got a new generation in our streets today. We've got a new generation that's, that's governing by, uh, because they've been elected mayors of cities. We've got a new generation of governors that could care less. And it says, it seemingly says, it's okay for this anarchy to go on in our streets. I'll do nothing about it. Let them do what they want to do. I heard one member of, of Congress, and she goes by three letters, say this week about the burning and the things that's gone on. She said they've been pent up for these months. They're hungry. They need to get out and do what they need to do. A member of Congress. Unbelievable. A new generation in Israel. A, I'm going to add this. A generation that was unwilling to fight. A generation that had not served in the, in the military, so to speak. A generation that knew nothing of bleeding and nothing of dying. And I think in America we've got the same stinking bunch in the streets right now. Unwilling to serve. Not going to serve. Unwilling to die. Unwilling to bleed. Just destroying property and doing what they can do. Burning down buildings. Not one of them has served, in my opinion. They certainly have not bled. The verse in Judges says that a new generation has had taken over. And it's happened to us as well. And you don't have to turn there because I'm going to read this. But in the 17th chapter, unless you want this mark, in the 17th chapter in verse 6, here's what is going on in Israel. There was no king in Israel. And every man... That means mankind. Every man and woman did that which was right in their own eyes. Anarchy. We've got the same thing, do we not? No fixed standard. Is that not where we are today? No fixed standard. Listen to some polls that you might find interesting. A Gallup poll taken in 1960 asked Americans, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Now, this is 1960. Sixty-five percent of those polled in 1960 answered the question, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. The same question was polled again 32 years later in 1992. Same question. 65% said we believe the Bible is God's Word in 1960. 32% answered the same question in 1992. 32% believed that the Bible was the Word of God. And so Gallup followed up with this question in 1992. Do you believe, after he asked about the Bible... Do you believe that there is absolute truth? That there is no absolute truth? I won't say this right. Do you believe there is absolute... Okay. Do you... I, I, I'm sorry. I just want this to be... No, no mistake about it. Do you believe there is absolute truth? And so the first question, do you believe the Bible's Word of God? 32% said no. The second question was, do you believe there is absolute truth? 68% answered no. There is no absolute truth. Shortly after that poll was taken in 92, George Barna followed up with the same question. And he asked, do you believe there is absolute truth? And this time, he polled only churchgoers. Okay? Do you believe there is no absolute truth? 52% of the church-going people answered, there is no absolute truth. The Lord said in the first chapter, in verse 19, do not make any league with these folks. And he says, I'll drive them out. Listen, the failure of the, and the lack of leadership among Israel was not God's problem, was it? It wasn't that God lacked the ability to drive out the inhabitants. It was the lack of faith that the people had in God that he would do such a thing. 
It was their problem. It was their failure. In the valley, the people looked down and saw the inhabitants living there, the Canaanites, and they had strong armies and chariots. And they said, well, we can't, we can't go down there and run them out. So they went up to the hill country and, and took care of all the folks up there. But they left those in, in, the, in the valley. So there's this mindset of those that just can't believe God and, and won't trust God. And so we kind of make some kind of compromise along the way. And here's what Israel did. In the first chapter, verse 19, Now the Lord was with Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they could not, you see that, drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. That's not, God said, I'll drive them out. You go down there and get after them, you'll be victorious. But, but here was Judah watching the inhabitants in the valley and saying, they, they, look how strong they are, look at all the armor they have, look at all the people they have, look at the military might, look at the chariots they've got. We, we, just, uh, we just can't do it. So the first thing under days of compromise that began with Israel was they feared their enemies. They feared their enemies. Who do we fear today? We're kind of in the same boat, aren't we? We fear what the virus is doing. We fear gangs in, in America. We fear this, and we've got fears of that. The same thing that we're living in. We're not trusting God to do the things that we know to do. We're doing it on our own. And therefore, there's a fear factor involved here. Look at the first chapter, verse 28. It came about when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Unbelievable, don't you think? That's not what God said. God said, drive them out. So they decided they'd make slaves out of them. They, they were going to make forced laborers out of them. So there were those in the land they feared, and there were those in the land that they favored. Again, that's not what God said. We can't drive them out. We'll make servants out of them. We'll just use them to our advantage. Sounds like us. They may be wicked. They're immoral. Hey, we can use them. We'll put them to work. Look at verse 29. I'm, going to, I'm not going to read each verse. I'm going to read parts of each verse through verse 34. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. The latter part of that verse says, So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. 30. Zebulun did not drive out the inha inhabitants. The latter part of 30 says, So the Canaanites lived among them. Ver verse 31. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. Going to verse 32, it says, so they just lived among the Canaanites. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive them out, but the latter part of that verse says, but they lived among the Canaanites. Verse 34, the, then the Amorites, which were the, which was the enemies of God, the Amorites forced the sons of Dan, the Israelites, of all people, into the hill country. Forced them up there and said, you stay up there, and if you come down, we'll kill you. It's just unbelievable what's going on. So there were those that they, they feared, there were those that they favored, and watch this, and there were those that they fellowshiped with as well. They fellowshiped with them. Can't drive them out. We'll just live together. We'll just fellowship with them. God said, don't do this. And they fellowshiped with them, and they learned about their religions, and they learned about their practices, and they learned about their immoral ways, and they learned about this, and God said, friendship with the world is enmity with me. And the word enmity means hostility. Be not conformed to this world, God says. Our nation is keeping company with the Canaanites, crying out loud. Aren't they? Aren't we? Listen, now I'm going to give you a, a, a dumb illustration, but there's a point to this. It's the summertime of 1989. There was a guy living in L.A. That's not Laura Levy, by the way. That's Los Angeles. Living in L.A. by the name of Larry Waters. He concocted this 
idea that we don't, I don't have anything to do. So he went and bought 45 pretty good-sized balloons, tied them all to a lawn chair, fixed him some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, got him a six-pack, sat down in the chair. His thought was to his buddies, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just float around above the city here a couple hundred feet, and I'll be back down here after a while. Well, his buddies untied the string, 45 helium-filled balloons. What do you think happened to Larry Waters? He shot up to 11,000 feet in just a few minutes. 11,000 feet. A continental pilot in a DC-10 radioed that there was this unidentifiable flying object out in, 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 to, off to his uh, side there. Helicopter was sent up to see what's going on. Larry Waters floated around at 11,000 feet for four hours. And slowly, he began to descend back to the ground. When he touched down, obviously there was a group of people that had gathered just to, <laughs> just to see him, along with a number of reporters. One reporter asked these two questions. Were you scared? With his eyes, they, according to the article, as big as saucers, Larry Waters said, yep. Are you going to do it again? Nope. Couldn't even talk. He couldn't even put a sentence together. Now, I said, I gave you that illustration to tell you that's exactly what America, that's exactly what Americans do with sin. We're just going to go up 100 feet. We're just going to dabble into it. We're not going to go very far out into left field, into, into this belief. We're just going to do it a little ways. And before long, we're at, we're at 11,000 feet, not believing that we're there, and, and, and unable really to know how we're going to get down. And I think one of, the, one of the things that's going to happen with America and with those who walk away from God is they're going to stand before Him in judgment one day, and all they're going to be say, able to say with their eyes as big as saucer is, yes, sir, and no, sir. Because they never thought they'd have to give an account to God. I'm not talking about flying in a, in a lawn chair. I'm talking about a life lived apart from God. That's what I'm talking about. That's the way we are. That's where we've come. That's, where, that's not where we're going to be. It's where we are. Adrian Rogers said one time that sin will take you further than you want to go. And it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you will, are willing to pay. In the second chapter, verse 2, As for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this that you have done? And God, I think, would like to <coughs> cry out to this nation and say, What in the world is this that you are doing and this that you have done? Canaanites, we fear. Yeah, we've got some. Maybe right now it's the virus. Maybe it's some that we just fear, something that we fear. But there are also things in the land that we favor, and there are things that we have fellowship with as well that we shouldn't be fellowshipping with. Here's the final thought this morning. <clears throat> days of consequences. There were days of comparison, days of compromise, and days of consequences. And it's the third and fourth verses of the second chapter that uh, I think we ought to read. Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but, now watch this, here's what God says is going to happen to you, Israel, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare unto you. And when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. They knew God had spoken, and they knew they, 
that their, the protection of God was going to be gone, and they had now to answer to him about this. I, I think there are a few nations in the history of the world that's been blessed as much as ours has. And few nations have gone as far into sin as much as ours has in the last few years. Economically, militarily, socially, we've been blessed. But I'll tell you something right now, in my opinion, we don't have a clue what to do in North Korea. And we don't know what to do with China. And we don't know what to do with Russia. And we don't know what to do with Iran. And we're doing all this and that in Afghanistan. Have we made any headway at all with all the years we've spent in Afghanistan? God said, I'll make these nations to become a snare to you. There'll be a thorn in your side. And here we are at home. We know more about violence than anything else, don't we? Really? One week ago today, the count was 64 in Chicago that had been shot in the last 24 hours, 13 of whom died. Is anybody doing anything about it? A little toddler in New York City, a little one and a half or two year old kid sitting with his mother, shot in the stomach this past weekend. Anybody doing anything about it? The governor sure isn't. What's the matter with people? Do we want anarchy like this everywhere? Thorns and snares will be yours, says God. Violence and rage will fill our streets. That's what's happening. Verse 6 through 10 here. Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel, who went to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of their elders who survived Joshua, who had seen the great work of the Lord which he had done. Verse 10 again. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done. There arose another generation. A generation that needs to walk with God. A generation that needs to understand that there is a true God in heaven that loves us and will forgive us and will fix everything that's wrong. But I'm afraid we're past, way past the fixing point. I think we're waiting on God's judgment. God has, has taken his protection from us, in my opinion. We have invoked his anger. We have, as I said a few weeks ago, we've lost his smile upon us. There was no king in Israel. So what was everybody doing? That which was right in their own eyes. All right. These things, says God, will be thorns to you. And these things will be snares to you. Is there any hope? I know this is a very negative message concerning America, but is there any hope for me and you? Only in the fact that God loves us. Only in the fact that we as his children can live for him, even though we make very little splash as far as, far as the nation or the world is concerned, we can still serve him, can we not? Nevertheless, it's still in the Bible. It's in verse 16 of the second chapter. And it's, it, it's nevertheless in the English. It's then. In the, then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who had plundered them. I don't know what God has got for us. I think the next thing on his agenda for the world is judgment. In my opinion, there's so much wrong. There's so much wrong in our land. There's so much wrong with our leadership. So much wrong with everything. But we can serve the Lord. And we can, we can be people that will bring honor and glory to Him, even in these last days. We can make a difference here in Sherwood, Arkansas. In the place where you go this week, we can still make a difference for the Lord. But I'll tell you something. It's pretty bleak, our, our future. It's pretty bleak. I, I don't mean, I, I'm talking about our nation's future. Everyone did that which was right in his own side. God loves you today. God loves this nation. But he doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't overlook it. He's going to deal with us, the U.S., in, in good time. We'll love him and serve him till he comes. Won't we? Won't we? Let's stand together for a few moments. It seems that it's 
always appropriate to pray. Pray for our nation and for each other. Pray that God would be merciful to us, be with us in the things that are going on, things that's going to go on. I think it's going to be pretty serious in the next few days. I don't know about the virus. I'm just talking about pretty serious as we deal with a holy God, the way that we've treated him. So thank you this morning for being here. Thank you to those that have, have been a part of the service through the airways. May he bless you all. Again, I'd like to talk with you about any spiritual need that you have, and that God would bless you and take care of you. And we'd welcome new members to our church, and, and we'd, we honestly would love to do that. Uh, just just, uh, just can't do it right now with the invitation that, that we normally give. But we want you to know we love you. We count it a joy to worship with you. I hope you have a good week, a blessed one. I'll see you along the way. If you would, after we finish praying, would you re remain where you are and let our ushers uh, lead you out and so we won't be jammed up together as in the aisles and things. Uh, it, it, we're, we're trying to practice this social distancing. We want our people that's a little leery of coming back to feel safe when they do. And, um, and I'd appreciate you just being considerate of others as we depart here in a few moments. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, the word that really lays very heavy on our hearts. Pray for our nation today, Father. There's so many things, not just wrong, but terribly wrong in the minds of those that lead us. And we just pray that you would just uh, change that, those hearts and melt those stony hearts and do a work that would bring repentance about to this nation. We love you so much, and we thank you for the, everyone that's here this morning, especially visitors that's here. Thank you for their presence. Bless their lives this week and ours as well. We just pray for Miss Freddie. Ask your blessings and your comfort care be upon her and her family right now. And you'd care for those that are sorrowing today. We, we, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Just stay where you're at for just...